Ladies and gentlemen, we have a big show, a real big shoe. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today, Joe's mom is ecstatic because we welcome back one of her favorite people, other than me. It's New York Times columnist Carl Richards. Plus, in headlines, what does Susie Orman have to do with cannabis? Dude, we'll lay out the heavy details on you, yo. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, and I'll dazzle both of you with my incredible trivia. And now, two guys who are buckled up and ready to rock their Wednesday, it's Joe and O J J J J G. We are ready to rock because it's Wednesday and unlike Monday where I thought it was Wednesday, it actually is Wednesday, OG. We are halfway done with this week. Wait, this is today Friday? What's that? Well, Monday was Wednesday, then Wednesday's Friday. Well, unfortunately, Monday wasn't Wednesday. Wednesday's remember? a new Friday. Spoiler, Wednesday not be Friday. How about in the summertime, Wednesdays are Fridays from now on? I, I am down with that. Let's pass some legislation. Let's get that thing taken care of. It's fantastic. Okay. If I can get paid for five, but work three, I'm in. That's what you normally do. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamin Show. I am Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter, just so you know which voice is which. And across the card table from me today, as he is every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's my good friend, the other guy, or as we call him, OG. Tis me. Today, dude, we are talking to the, the Carl Richards. Whoa. I love that guy. But you're not in love with him. I'm so well, I might be. But he is such a cool dude. He is such uh he's very zen. He's incredibly zen and he breaks these all this complicated stuff people have between their ears and goes, wait, it's not that complicated. Love that. Absolutely love it. You know what else I love? Love learning new skills. Thanks to Skillshare for supporting Stacking Benjamins. You can join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare with this special offer. How about two months of unlimited access to over 27,000 classes on Skillshare for free to sign up, head to Skillshare.com forward slash SB. Great show today. Carl Richards in the house. But before that, we got a couple headlines. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Market Watch. News about the Sues. Susie Orman back in the news. I wish that woman got some press. It's Suze, anyway. Susie Orman is a stock picker, Sean Langua writes. And this is her biggest trading regret. You ever wonder about our biggest trading regret? By the way, just, just to give people some history, Susie Orman is known for telling people to buy lots of municipal bonds. Hmm. Buy tons of municipal bonds. Because when you have a bajillion dollars... And you live on an island, like she said, when she was here over and over and over, she made sure that we knew that she lived on an island, which, by the way, is the reason she's like, it's Long Island. But no, 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 no. She made, it is her own of course, island in the Bahamas that she owns because I'd live on an island if I had money to buy an island, wouldn't you? Absolutely. And, and, and I got to tell and you, I would probably tell a lot of people. Well, and people. Well, that, no, I wouldn't. People that think that we're razzing on Susie. Kind of. We are. But I found when Susie came here, she was awesome. She was exactly what you would expect Susie to be. She had those tail feathers out, man. And it was it was a ton of fun <laughs> as she peacocked around the basement. Yeah. Making sure we knew that she was Susie Orban. Yep. But and I had did an island. But I did like her point. She said, you know what? The world needs Susie Orman. And I think that's true. But that's not gonna stop us <laughs> from poking a little. That being said. Yes. Poking a little fun. While Orman, who recently joined up with online platform and mobile app Mogul and will be the keynote speaker at the Mogul X conference in New York in September, generally doesn't school her target audience on the ins and outs of trading individual stocks. A consistent investment in index funds makes more sense for most people. She certainly developed a strong taste for the shifting moods of the market since her days as a stockbroker. 
Susie says, oh my God, I have over a hundred stocks and not a day goes by where I don't talk about them with the man who watches over my money. She recently explained to Market Watch, adding that she breaks all her investments into several different portfolios, blockchain, cannabis, municipal bonds, preferred stocks, et cetera. <laughs> That's so funny. I'm diversified. Oh yeah. Uh, tell me about your diversification. Uh, 25% munis, uh, 25% blockchain, 25% cannabis, and 25% preferred stock. <laughs> like what in the Sam hello? What a miserable advisor or miserable client she must be to be for that advisor broker. Calling him up every day to oh talk about God. your cannabis stock. Did you see them? It's down an eight. Like She would use those terms too, like the old school ones. It's down an eight. It's down a quarter. I don't understand. I don't understand why she does this press. Like all the stuff that Susie's advocated over time. Why would she do this press saying something that is so unbelievably destructive for so many people? Like, you know, people are going to read this and go, oh, cannabis. Oh, blockchain. I should probably buy those. Or I should be calling every hour on the hour for an update on my portfolio. Yeah. I, I just it's it's mesmerizing. What should you? So we we just talked about what you shouldn't do. Let's turn that frown upside down, as mom says. And let's let's talk about the positives here. What should you do if you know she talks about the man managing your money? How often should you be talking to your advisor? Once a year is adequate. Twice a year, adequate. Four times a year, maybe. More than that, probably is too much. I think you should certainly be talking to them whenever something big happens well, yeah, in your life. Exclusive of like, hey, I got a new job or I got a you know, I got them married. I got married or I had kids or whatever, like all those, because that's going to change the plan. Yeah. You're talking about, but regular check-ins once, twice, four times, may, maybe. Yeah, four times. Maybe. But beyond that, talk to them when life changes. Mm -hmm. But what about when your cannabis stock goes down an eighth? Then at least every half hour. I always found it surprising when clients wouldn't call me and big changes happened in their life. I said this the other day, I was talking to somebody and a whole bunch of stuff had changed in the, I don't know, eight months that we had not chatted. I was just thinking the whole time, like all of this radically changes the plan, right? You change jobs, kids in college now, like all this stuff is going on. I think we should be updating it a little bit more, but um, yeah, you want, yeah, they were comfortable. So you want your advisor to be, in your corner, but it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, if, if, if the people are on your team, make them part of your team. I would love it when people called me and said, hey, just wanted to let you know, uh, we've got a new member of the family on the way. Yeah. God willing, you knew that it was coming. Yeah. And in some cases, they'd even say, I think we got this covered. We were thinking this, this, this. What do you think? Yeah. And I could always add stuff to the discussion to make that work better. Even when people were buying a new car. Say, hey, I don't, you know, I don't know. We're, we're buying a new car. Uh, what do you think? Very quick, 10 minute discussion. Yeah. There's some commentary about experiences that I've observed over the last 20 years of. Yeah. Or which pot of money to this. take it from, or mm -hmm. if you're spending down the emergency fund because this wasn't expected. Just so many, so many different things. Things change. Yeah. What do you think about the eclectic investment choices that Susie has? Yeah. I don't think it represents a financial plan. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've talked before about it being a ship and about how you've got the hull of your portfolio, then the sail, maybe the spinnaker sail and the, the anchor. I don't see any of that. I see municipal bonds and cannabis stock. Like It's, I'm, a, it's a barbell strategy. Does she have that <laughs> going on? One end does nothing but save you money on taxes. The other end is like uh, putting all your money on the roulette wheel. I kind of think about this from time to time, although not anywhere near it. I often wonder, does there eventually come a time where you can go, yeah, I'm good. But then the other side of it, it's almost like the, the same question of like, well, I got to retirement. I hit the number. Now I can let off the gas a little bit. I'm not saying that municipal bonds are letting off the gas because frankly, most people don't understand how risky those things are anyway. But I think the problem with that is you're missing out on the next you know, half a generation of or more than that, I guess, maybe two generations of compounding that that money could be... Like we talk about the 
importance of the last double right before you get, you know, from 55 to 64, that last time it doubles your money, right? And you go from a million and a half dollars to 3 million, how important that is. But how important is it also to, from 65 to 100, to get those fo- those other four doubles where you go to six and 12 and 24 and 48 million? And like, how does that change the dynamics of the family tree year after, you know, generation after generation versus going, well, I've got my, I've got my money. You know, my plan said I needed three million. I've got it. Now I can let off the gas versus going, why can't I keep on growing this from now until forever? Future generations yeah. or legacy or it's kind of like a trade off, you know, and I, like I said, I'll be interested to see how I think about it when I'm, when I'm seeing, I might be like, oh, with those guys, I got mine, you know? Well, if at this point she thinks it's fun, she has enough money. She thinks it's fun. Yeah. She might own like two shares of a hundred stocks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seriously doubt that. <laughs> But, but yeah, uh, our next, don't be like Susie. That's the message. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a financial plan. Mm -hmm. That is not a plan. Our second headline comes to us from investment news is written by Mark Schaff Jr. Found this interesting women whose spouses control the finances may be putting themselves and their families at risk. It says danger when it comes to steering the financial ship, women are hesitant to make waves. Over 40 years of marriage, one of Stacey Francis's clients took a backseat to her husband when it came to the family's investment and finances. In fact, she was given a strict budget she felt didn't provide enough money to cover expenses for their life in New York with their two children. Her husband took delight in her struggles, said Ms. Francis, president and CEO of financial planning firm Francis Financial. She thought they were destitute because she was given so little to live on, Ms. Francis said. That was his way of controlling her. Later, when her clients got divorced, she learned the couple had more than $10 million in investments. Even though she took steps to stand up for herself by getting out of the marriage, financial autonomy is still a long way off for the client. She had worked with Ms. Francis on an hourly basis through the divorce, but against Ms. Francis' counsel, decided to continue to rely on her husband, who was himself a financial planner for financial advice. This is messed up. <laughs> this is just so messed up. <laughs> this is very screwy. But it is tough. I want to get to this point. I want to ask you if this still happens today. You're working with a couple. You're talking to them on the phone and they say, well, you know what? Both of us aren't going to come to the meeting because X person controls the finances. This piece about somebody getting really shafted by their spouse and not really knowing what was going on, being surprised that they had $10 million of investments. None of that would have happened if they just did it together. I think the difference here is that the person was also the third party professional. You know what I mean? Like, in your example, you're talking about a couple and then having an advisor there. But when the part of the couple is the advisor, you don't have that third party person to go, you know, I think this is a little silly. I always like to just kind of play Columbo a little bit. And you start doing the math sometimes and you say, okay, well, this is how much your salary is. And this is how much, okay, so you're maxing out your 401ks and you got this mortgage payment. And you start kind of, and you go, are you? are you guys living on like three grand a month, (laughs) you know, with a $6,000 mortgage payment? Like, how's that work? Oh, no, 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 no. We're uh, using a whole bunch of bonus money. Ah, okay. You know, you got to kind of feel out like what's really going on. And if it doesn't seem right, it probably, you know, there's more to the story. It doesn't make it wrong to live on your bonus money, of course, but you want to understand it. I think the benefit of, you know, the third party person there is, just kind of double checking it along the way. I've always thought that if you can't have both people in the room, especially in important decision times, right? Like, you know, in like tactical stuff and it's okay, well, let's talk about the rebalancing plan or whatever. And the other person doesn't want to be involved in that. So be it. But when you're talking about, okay, here's how much money we have to save to reach the goals that you guys told me about. It's important that both of them have some input. I'm really particular about both people in the, in the relationship having their own separate opinion about volatility because who's going to blow that up. It's going to be the person who wasn't part of all the discussions who goes, have you seen the statements? We're down a hundred grand. This is ridiculous. I found that every time it was the person who didn't come to the meetings. That was the person that wanted to blow up the plan when things got bad. Yeah. And so if there's a big disparity between the two in terms of their tolerance for volatility, that's fine. That's, that's okay. That can happen. Let's just make sure that the plan recognizes that for both. And this is his money. He's really conservative. 
So we're going to make his money match what is his tolerance. And then her money, she wants to be a little bit more aggressive and, you know, fill that in. But let's talk about this. You know, a lot of you and I have seen it's such a tired topic, this topic of one checkbook or two, right? Yeah. Do they have separate? and, And that is, to me, just it's so irrelevant in the days where you can track things as a family together. Apps like Zeta or HoneyFi, where families can work together. We've had both of them on the show. If you go back and you go to Friday FinTech segments, you can find them very easily on our past shows. Just go to our Stacking Benjamins page and put Zeta or HoneyFi in the search box. But anyway, with all that, I don't think it matters how many checkbooks you have. But certainly, everybody knowing what's going on financially with the family, that to me is the most important thing. I get horrified when I hear stories like this of, Mm -hmm. you know, one family member just has no idea what's going on with the family's money in general. And although we don't want bad things to happen, you know, OG, at one point in any relationship, one of you is going to die. It's going to happen. And maybe before that, something bad happens in the relationship. We don't wish that on anybody. But if it does, you got to know what's going on. Yeah. It's so frustrating. And when I when I read statistics like this one, they just make me so frustrated. A UBS poll of 3,652 women around the world found 58% defer long-term financial decisions to their spouses or ex-spouses. Participants included 2,241 married women with at least a million dollars in investable assets and 1,401 who were divorced or widowed. You can't do that. Got to have some skin in the game. Oh, it just, it's, it's horrible. And I don't think this is, by the way, and I understand the family dynamic historically, why this would be such a problem for women. But whether it's women or men, it doesn't matter. It's probably 50 50 now. It doesn't matter what the gender is. You can delegate some of the decisions about who's going to press the buttons, but you can't delegate controls of knowing where the ship's headed. I think that's our first takeaway. Our second takeaway, uh, cannabis stocks, municipal bonds, and blockchain might not be an investment strategy. Hope is not an investment strategy. (laughs) Well, he is a gentleman who we're so happy we've been able to talk to him a few times. He is not only a gentleman who is an accidental financial professional, he also is a columnist for the New York Times. We're talking about none other than the Carl Richards. Let's say hi to Carl coming down to the basement. And walking down the stairs to the basement, it's Mr. Behavior Gap himself. Carl Richards is with us. How are you, man? Super good. Yeah, really fun to get a chance to chat with you again. And it's funny how similar the basement looks to last time I was here. And it's a completely different basement. How about that? <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> How'd you pull that off? Well, it takes skills. Skills with a Z. Yeah. Yeah, with a That's Z. Exactly right. The last right. time I talked to you, you lived in Utah. It's been a good three years, four years, maybe. And now tell me where you're living. Yeah, so we are three years into a one year trip to New Zealand. So we live in uh, on the South Island of New Zealand in a small little town surrounded by national parks and big rivers and, and the ocean. Did you get lost? Is that the deal? <laughs> it's pretty close. It's been such an amazing experience. We've sort of given up, you know, like it's funny coming from somebody who's supposed to be a quote unquote planner. Um, we've sort of given up on making plans because um, we sort of think men and women make plans and God laughs, right? So we were like, well, we'll we're here. We'll see what happens for the next six months. So we've thoroughly enjoyed it. But is this part of the plan? I mean, I'm thinking we just had uh, David Bach down to the basement and he's headed to Tuscany for a year to live with his family. You're in New Zealand. Is this part of the big master plan? It would be really cute and slightly clever of me to give you a story and a narrative about how it was part of the master plan. But the truth is, no. I mean, we had been looking for opportunities to live outside of the United States just for the experience of it all. We'd been looking for 20 years, 
So it wasn't that we weren't kind of playing in that traffic. Yeah, we were playing in that traffic. But if you had said three months before we actually moved to New Zealand, our whole family, if you had said three months before we actually got on the plane that we were going to New Zealand, we would have said, no, it hadn't even crossed our mind three months before. Not once. And you guys, it, I'm, I'm just imagining no. you and your spouse sit down to dinner one night. You're like, how does New Zealand sound? Had you been there before? We'd never been here. I'll tell you the quick story. We had thought about trying to move to France. We've got a daughter who just by sheer luck, the school we were in in Park City, Utah, was the school she was zoned for, started a pilot program when she started in kindergarten, half the day in French, half the day in English, all the subjects in French, all the subjects in English, and then they would switch. And so by the time she was in fourth or fifth grade, we had been entertaining the idea like, hey, you know, someday it'd be cool to spend a school year. That was our thought, a school year in France. We had gone to some mountain towns in France because we lived in a mountain town and our other kids would have loved skiing and the Alps and all that stuff. We thought about that and we were trying to make that work. We gave up on it because we we had a, a service opportunity with my church actually that came up that was going to be for a set number of years. So we were like, wow, we put that on the back burner. And then a little another window opened. We thought France and we started checking into it. It's just nothing was working. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. And we we were complaining to, well, I'm probably not complaining because it was my wife. She probably wasn't complaining. She was just telling a friend about it. And the friend says, oh, you should go to New Zealand. I have a house there and, you know, car and, and kayaks and, and you guys should go there. And 10 days later, we had plane tickets. Unbelievable. Yeah. And we'd never been here. We didn't end up staying in our house. We didn't end up doing any of that stuff. But 10 days later, that's how the whole decision was made on on where to go and, and how to get here was my wife's conversation at yoga. <laughs> how do you think about the fire movement? Because this seems very fiery to, mm. you know, mm. live kind of for the moment. That's a really, really interesting question, actually, because the only dilemma with it is, and this is, Joe, I haven't had really like a conversation about this publicly, so it's fun. Um People get this impression, and I just want to clear this up. People get this impression that it's like, oh, easy for you to do, Mr. Moneybags, or something. It's really important for all of us to understand that that sort of view it is always relative, right? So I've got friends who make ridiculous money and have saved ridiculous money, like airplane rich style money, who are like, oh, I'd love to do that, but I just can't afford it. You know, you're like, what are you talking about? And then I've got other friends that have nothing, nothing, and they're traveling around the world. And again, we've got to also separate out like traveling is the thing. Well, no, I'm not even saying that. Like, I, I'm simply saying if you've got a thing that you want to do, and for us, it happened to be go spend some time in another country. For you, it could be see every museum in your in your city. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. If you've got a thing that you want to do, I think we end up saying, and I think the fire movement strikes, there's elements of the fire movement that strike me as like, I bet if there are elements of the fire movement that would look at my balance sheet and say what we're doing is irresponsible. And my response would be, well, wait, I think you missed a line item on my balance sheet. The line item says experiences with the family. We've put a value to that that is ours, not yours. It's ours. And so I think if you've got a thing that you want to do, no matter, and I'm thing agnostic, so it doesn't matter what the thing is, let's stop using money. Now, I realize it's also sometimes a legitimate reason, but let's stop looking for excuses to not do the thing because it's always relative. So you've got to figure out how to... Oh, man, so much to say here. And I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But often when we take these sorts of I want to see every museum in my state, I want to travel to the three national parks that are within four hours, I, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. But whatever it is, often it's new and novel, meaning we can't point to 15,000 other people who've done it and blame them if it goes wrong. <laughs> so this new and novel thing is scary. It's fun. But I think it's what life is made of. And if that means that it's going to be partially a little scary because it's financially a little scary, I'm not here to judge. And I think that's one of the things we need to give each other a little bit more room around is like, 
this is all relative. It's all personal. We don't know what's really going on in other people's lives. And let's just see how much we can support each other in making the best decisions we can as we stumble through this thing called life, right? That was way more than you wanted, but I've been thinking about it for a long time. So since you asked. Well, it's funny because I've been thinking a lot about that myself this morning. I was thinking just reading some very critical comments on social media, which is, you know, seven out of 10 times social media is pretty toxic, but I feel Mm -hmm. like it's, why is it so easy for us to put a little stank on somebody else's goals? Yeah, there's a lot there. It's a big part of a project I'm working on that we'll be talking about in a year or two, I'm sure. But we're threatened. I mean, none of us would admit this, but what's going on behind is a little bit of like, we are far more interested. Rene Girard, who's having his moment in Silicon Valley with the mimetic desire stuff on, we are far more interested in being seen as X than we are in being X. And so we could use like, we're far more interested in being seen as thrifty or frugal than actually being it. We are far more interested in being seen as, you know, living a rich life than actually living a rich life. And I think when we see people, what we see, especially, I mean, this is compounded in social media. We don't even need to go there, but just when we see other people living their doing their thing, especially if it involves any sort of public doing of things, right? Like they're doing their thing. They're living a life. I'm going to use some cliche words here. Like they're living a life of passion and purpose. They're excited. You know, those people, they're people. I like to say, Joe, they're people who are up to something. Like when we run into people who are up to something, it reminds us, I think there's a little whisper that's like, Hey, I I have one of those things, but I've been jamming it down for so many years because that's what society told me to do. And that gap between our current reality and this thing that we really want to do is painful. And we see other people doing it. And we in in New Zealand, they have a saying called tall poppy syndrome. And the tall poppy syndrome is like when you start doing your thing, people will cut you down because it's like, hey, that's not what we do here. You know, people from here don't do that. People like us don't go to that school. And instead, maybe we could do it the other way. Maybe we could say, oh, wow, look at that person growing in the sun and feel sort of motivated and pulled towards doing our own thing by their inspiration. I had, <laughs> I had, sense? it does. Well, and as you're talking, I'm thinking I had to make myself a screensaver several times that when my computer screen pops off and all I see is this, it says focus in because I know when I focus yeah. out on what everybody else is doing, I get depressed. Mm-hmm. I feel competitive, but not in a good way. When I'm focusing on reaching my own internal goal, everything changes. Mm -hmm. I get happy. I get this warm fuzzy. I think that's really, I was working on this model last week with a friend slash coach slash therapist who we were talking about matching your inner reality to your outward experience. And obviously the problem is we as humans are really bad at first, even understanding what our inward reality is. Like first sort of getting quiet enough and clear enough about what that even is. Like in the language I'm using, like, what is that dream? What is that thing? Even understanding that's hard. And then putting it, matching it to your outward reality, like actually putting it out there, you run into all these other problems because most people are going to just cut you down like a tall poppy and say, hey, we people like you don't do things like that. Who gave you permission? Where's your permit? You know, all that <laughs> imposter syndrome stuff, all of that stuff starts showing up and you've got to just have the screensaver pop up and go, Oh, that's right. I've got my head down doing my own thing. I'm just going to keep doing it. And and I'm not going to worry too much about the reaction or the feedback. I'm going to try and be focused on whether I'm being true to my myself. I like this idea you talk about, about getting quiet enough. I'm going to just steal that little, little phrase for a second, because you can tell by the nature of your work, Carl, that you realize and know that most of financial planning is between your ears, right? When did that first strike you? Like, was that apparent from the beginning or was there a time when you're working with people and you're like, oh my God, this is much easier than we're all making it? Yeah. And it's interesting. I would even push back a little bit on, it's not only is it between your ears, but it's in your heart, right? Like it, it gets even a little deeper. This isn't about money and spreadsheets, Joe, right? Like we, it's not, it's about, it's about dreams and fears and worries and concerns. 
And the money in the spreadsheets, people hide behind that. It's a little bit like some entrepreneurs or designers or artists hide behind like what size should the logo be or what color should the font be or or sorry, what size should the font be or what color should the logo be? And you're like, no, just make the thing. Um, (laughs) Somebody, somebody told me once, and I think this is apropos, actually it was at at a podcasting conference I was at. They were saying, you know, when you walk up to Michelangelo, you don't say, uh, what brush is that? Yeah, yeah, that reminds yeah, it's, it's, I've heard Seth tell the story. Of Stephen King was speaking in an audience and, you know, 5,000 writers. And the first question was, what pencil do you use? <laughs> and I, yeah, I think well, those are great. Like, stop. Hi- like, it doesn't matter. We've, you know, Helene Olin and Harold proved you can do it on an index card. This debate endlessly about what is the right portfolio or even better, like which automated investment service am I going to use or, you know, do you save 7% to emerging markets or not? And which cash flow, like all of that stuff, just put it in an S and P 500 index fund and start focusing on the real thing. Like, why are you spending so much or whatever your thing is? It's the same all the way around. Those are places to hide and we as humans will take them. But do you remember where you were when you first realized that? I can tell tell exactly where I was. It was, and the reason is I, I got into this industry by accident. I thought I was applying for a security guard job. I didn't realize there was a difference between security and securities. Well, you know, and (laughs) well, as you, as you do. And, (laughs) and then I got the job and I was in like six weeks of training and my training ended in the latter part of the summer of 95. And I was walking out onto the trading floor out of the training room, you know, like after I got over, I wasn't a security guard. I, I realized like, Hey, this is a, this is a math job. Like in the training room, everything, right. Two plus two always equaled four. It didn't matter. Like these were spreadsheets, calculators. It didn't matter how scared or fearful I was. Two plus two equaled four. And then one day late August, Netscape goes public. And I I doubt anybody listening to this is going to remember that, right? Like now it's ancient history, but Netscape was, yeah, never mind. I won't even explain what Netscape was. It's like, think of Google, bef- think of Google before Google was there. It's going to um, end up, it's going to end up being old guy stories. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, the, the point is it was a big IPO and we got called out onto the floor, onto the trading floor because the call volume was so high. So this is my first experience interacting with humans smashing up against the calculators. And I remember being struck by that because people were mad and people that they didn't get in because Netscape went from 12 to 24 to 76 in one day. I just remember being struck by it like, whoa, this is not about spreadsheets and calculators. So I got into the industry by accident. I stayed on purpose because of that experience of humans smashing up against calculators. So that's where I was. And then I just kept finding that over and over and over. Wait, this isn't about this isn't about um, here. One last story on that. I had two clients who I'll just call Bob and Sue. Bob and Sue came to me. They had plenty of plenty of money saved. They'd been really disciplined. They had some young kids. Bob was an emergency physician. And they were like, we think most docs get this wrong. They work, 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 work until their kids are like 17 or 18. And then they hope to have a little more, more time to spend with them. But by that point, they have purple hair and nose rings. They don't want to talk to mom and dad. So we'd like to flip that. We'd like to take a six-month sabbatical and travel around the country in our RV and visit family back east and see all the national parks. And do you think we could do that? Now, I already knew that financially it was not going to be a problem. They had been really disciplined. And so I knew that. I knew as soon as I put the calculator to it, but I knew that wasn't what this was about. So I said to them, Bob and Sue, before I calculate that, I just want to know one thing. If it says that this isn't stupid, right? If it says that you can go do this, if the calculator says that, will you? And I remember them looking at each other like, whoa, this just got real. They said, yeah, yeah, we will. So I said, well, give me a week because I got to crunch a lot of numbers. <laughs> <You> know, <Larry. laughs> so they, they went away. We came back a week later and I, I already knew the, and the answer was, yeah. And they did it, right? They went for six months and they still to this day talk about it. So I could tell you story after story like that, where it's not actually about the numbers. It's about the fear, the worry, the concern, the dreams, the hopes, all of that stuff. You were talking earlier about a coach slash mentor slash friend. Do you think that most people should have a coach slash mentor? 
Yeah, I so uh, the slash you didn't mention was therapist. Um, right. Yeah, so I, <laughs> yes, I, I do. There's some pretty strong evidence that, uh, in fact, my my buddy Professor Rob at the University of Utah just sent me an email about this. That pretty strong evidence that peer mentoring is better than you know mentor mentoring. So putting yourself in, I like to think of them as a financial circle. You know, like maybe you can get a, a group of five or six people, and I'm sure there are companies that have organized this. I just have checked out of all that. But I, I think getting a group of five or six, eight to ten even, people that are, you know, after kind of similar goals, but maybe different enough from you that they could see your blind spots, place where you feel comfortable sharing what you're trying to do. And then you go to them and say, hey, here's a decision I've made give me some disconfirming evidence, right? Like help me see my blind spots from your peers. The nice thing about peers is their ability to say, chances are if you have eight to 10 peers, one of them has run into your challenge and they can say, hey, here's what I did when I was dealing with that challenge. So yeah, I think maybe to your point, yes, people don't hire financial planners because they're dumb. They hire financial planners because they're not them. And you can build that same, I'm not saying you can replace a financial planner, but I'm saying you can build a lot of the same feedback loop by getting a group of people together, whether that's a mentor or a group of peers. Well, and and that's important, I think, Carl, because as you know, there's a group of people that say, well, I I can't afford that. I, I, once again, we go back, we have a bunch of excuses, but this whole idea of peer mentoring, I mean, we can all do that. Yeah, oh man, I can't resist. Like, I think there's two things. One, there are certain situations financially, jobs where, like, you've got a job, you've got a salary. There's no, and you may be sort of thinking there's no, nothing else you can do. And I'd point people to Ramit Sete's work on there. I think there are actually, I would push back that there are almost always is something you can do. But let's talk for a minute to the people who are running their own business, are engaged in quote unquote side hustles, you know, whatever you want to call it. Those people, if I can just speak to them for a minute about what you just said, that it might cost money, a huge, huge, huge switch flipped for me about two years ago when I started understanding the difference between an investment and an expense. And when I started viewing coaching and mentorship and learning and education as an investment, I mean, I spend more money than I would ever admit to anyone on a strength coach. I can't believe, in fact, we just, my wife and I just calculated the number last night, but I can point to about two years ago, I started seeing him as an investment, not an expense and not an investment, like in a weird way, like, oh, it makes my life better. Well, that's fine. That's actually fine. But I can point to direct ROI at the business from my work with the strength coach because it's made me more resilient and better. So that's just one example of, I don't think if if you have the ability to carry your own water and chop your own wood in terms of running your own business, I want to spend more on those sort of coaching because you can't afford not to is my theory. Yeah. Sorry, your point really was if you're in one of those situations where you can't see the ROI, Everybody can put together a group. There's a, there's, you've got friends just like you and all you're volunteering to do is say, Hey, look, can we maybe chat once a month? Or I think once a week, here's what I do once a week. I'd say, here's what this peer mentorship looks like. You tell me what you want to do this week, Joe. I'm going to write down what you tell me at the end of the week, we're going to meet again. And I'm going to repeat back to you. I'm going to show you the notes. I'm just going to hold them up to the video camera. These are your notes, not mine. And I'm going to tell you, and if you did it, I'm going to give you a high five. If you didn't do it, I'm going to punch you in the nose. (laughs) It's fight club mentoring. (laughs) Uh, I'm glad you said the nose, by the way. That's good. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's always the nose. (laughs) I want to ask you about what you're doing at the Behavior Gap now, because part of the reason I reached out to you was that I heard this rumor that you might have some coaching coming up of your own. You're going to be doing some of that as well. Yeah, we, we've, it's funny you say rumor because we've actually made it quite hard to find. <laughs> the, um, I heard it did. from a very reliable source though. So somebody yeah, yeah, gets yeah. the dirt. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, 
Well, we're making some big, big, big changes. And part of those changes, those, those are not part of the rumor you heard. You're hearing the rumor first here. Part of those changes are engaging in that little gap we talked about earlier. Like this, how do you take a dream and make it reality? Like that's that's some of the work we're going to be doing. And, and people should be on the lookout for that. And the best way to keep up with that is just to get on the weekly letter list. Just get the email once a week. I try to deliver as few words as possible in a sketch, but we, you know, we, our commitment is it will take you three minutes to read and, and our hope is you'll be thinking about it all week. But as we make some changes, it'll be announced there. But what you're referring to is we've, yeah, we've built this workshop on called talking about money and it's really specific. It's for spouses and partners. So it's not about how to talk about money with your kids. It's not about how to talk about money with a business partner. It's about how to talk about money with your spouse or your life partner. And so we've got that in the form. We're going to write a book. I keep getting asked to write that book. Finally, I was like, no, I don't want to write the book. So we created a little workshop for people. So that's what we've been up to there. That's fun. So so the other half of that rumor is no book coming. No book on talking about money. Another book on engaging with the mystery, you know, like the dreams, awesome. reality thing. It's it's going to involve dragons. It's, it's, uh, I can't awesome. tell you anymore, but it's, it's really exciting. <laughs> George R.R. R. Martin may or may not be involved. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you are in New Zealand, you know, isn't that where they did the Tolkien things? It's totally. There's dragons everywhere. Yeah. 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 yeah you For got sure. it. Uh, I'm going to link to the behavior gap.com. And so people can sign up for the letter and they can also check out what you're doing with the workshops. Carl Richards, man, as always, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. Uh, it was my pleasure. How do I get out of this place? That is, like... There is cheese at the end of one of these hallways. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> hey there, trivia fans, and welcome to your real favorite part of the show. My, uh, you know, well, like I said, you know, it's, it's trivia, right? I mean, it's favorite part of the show. And while anyone who knows me knows I'm not afraid of the spotlight, I mean, I deserve it after all. I do know how to be humble and recognize the talents of other greats that came before me. Take today, for example. Did you know that back in 1902, on today's date, the world's first modern electrical air conditioner became operational? I wonder where that guy got his inspiration from. Of course, it was developed in July, but, you know, that's not the trivia. Check this out. What was the name of the inventor behind modern air conditioning? I'll have your answer. The name of the man who deserves all of our thanks every hot night. Well, almost every hot night. Right after this. We talk a lot about learning on this show. How about learning from the best and the brightest so you avoid mistakes later? Well, a place that we really like is Skillshare. It's an online learning community for creators with more than 27,000 classes in design, business, and more. You'll discover countless ways to fuel your curiosity, your creativity, and enhance your career. You could take classes in just about anything, uh, financial planning, if you'd like, accounting, bookkeeping. There's all kinds of business classes for our business, of course, social media marketing. I took a great class in photography. You can take creative writing. Gertrude's done a couple on illustration that have been fantastic and have helped us a lot. But even more than that, they're pretty fun. So whether you're looking to start a new side hustle or maybe just discover a new passion, give yourself some new professional skills with a Z, Skillshare's there to keep you learning and thriving. To sign up, head to Skillshare.com forward slash SB. And if you use our code, that uh, Skillshare.com forward slash SB, you'll get two months of Skillshare for free. It's funny. I remember Tom Peters, the one of my favorite management gurus, talking about how nobody wants to be bad at their job. And yet we wait for other people to train us, to get them, to give us the skills that we need to succeed. Why wouldn't you create your own curriculum? With Skillshare, you can do that. You can join millions of students already learning on Skillshare. They've taken the reins. Get two months of Skillshare for free. Skillshare is giving the whole Stacker community two months unlimited access over 27,000 classes for free at Skillshare.com forward slash SB. Hey there, you AC hogs. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome back to the cool part of the show, my trivia. 
Before the break, I asked you about the history of air conditioning. Here was the exact question. What was the name of the inventor behind modern air conditioning? Your answer? Well, if you said anything other than the magnificent, revered, brilliant Willis Carrier, then shame on you. Excuse my rant here, but isn't this a man whose name should be on air conditioners nationwide? Shouldn't we have the word carrier in offices and homes and just everywhere? Shouldn't the name carrier be synonymous with air conditioning? What? Oh, that's a thing? There's even a company? Oh, my God. Huh. All right. Well, my bad. Carry on. Big thanks to Carl for coming down and chatting with us. You know, it's funny. It's funny, OG, picking up and just moving to New Zealand. He's like, and I'm out. It, it's so Carl. It's like, you know what? We just decided. Let's just move to New Zealand. Have you ever thought about that? Just picking up the family and just moving somewhere? I did that. Well, that's true. You did do that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, probably but, at a faster clip than most people make those decisions, frankly. Y- you did do that fairly quickly. But, you know, David Bach now is in Tuscany with his family. Forever? F- for a year. Oh. They're, they're moving there for a year. Carl said they were, you know, they're in what? What do you say? The fifth year of a two-year, what they thought was a two-year journey. We're in the sixth year of a, well, I guess forever. Of a forever? Yeah. Cheryl and I have talked about this. And as you know, that's our goal. If there's a way to be able to podcast from anywhere on earth. Like I'd, I'd love to be able to just do this from, from anywhere. I'd love to see you schlep all this gear. Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, seriously, between that and when I tried it, as you know, a couple of years ago, uh, to work while I was in Europe, man, every person who owned an Airbnb said, Oh yeah, we got great Wi-Fi." No. (laughs) Well, you have to get your own probably. You know what I mean? Like you have to, if you're going to go somewhere, you have to do like the six month stay. Yeah. And then order I, your own internet and get the yeah, I had to put fast plan or whatever. Considerably more legwork into it than I did. I even tried that from Northern Michigan and it, it, the plans in the town we were in were not even fast enough. Yeah. Like it was, it wasn't even the homeowner. It was the town. Yeah. Like it just hasn't reached there yet. But big thanks to Carl. And that's still so, doing horse and buggy up there. So exciting to have his uh, just, just, hey, we're, we're moving. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Well, right now, test taking, as I have uh, pages of tests that I have to take. And um, I don't know what else. Scoring well on the test. I don't know. And scoring well on the test. That's good. Good luck with that test. I have two that I have to take in the next week. For your profession? For my after school activity and my new hobby, which happens to lose lots of money. So it's a uh, business that is losing lots of money. Because <laughs> hobbies, <laughs> hobbies, you going to go on hobbies market? are n- not deductible for <laughs> tax purposes. When this show finally gets a fourth listener and we are very uh, wealthy and famous because of the show, you're going to go on Market Watch and tell everybody about how you like to lose money and buy cannabis stocks and yeah that's what gonna be my secret right here's what i do i get into all these things that are just huge money losers <laughs> well it's a it's the activity it's not the investment no i know uh it's actually your loved ones in your time that they list here as most important test taking must have been a close third it's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple head to stack forward slash haven life it is seriously ser- seriously simple They'll give you a free quote when you go there, stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life, and you'll see how simple the application is. The fact that it's online, it doesn't take 52 years to fill out a bunch of annoying, inane questions that nobody's ever going to use. They give you an instant coverage decision. Price is affordable. Of course, they're backed by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is more than 160 years old, OG. Might know a little bit about insurance. This uh, comes to us. He goes from never writing to us in the past to uh, twice in two weeks. Uh, Let's say hi to Tyson. Hello to everyone in the basement. This is Tyson in Alaska. I'm really looking forward to a free t-shirt. I was wondering, what is your opinion on what point in life does a person need to be at to hire a financial advisor? When you're debt free or when you have $100,000 sitting around or $10,000? Just kind of wondering in general. Thanks, bye. Good question, Tyson. Thanks for that question. 
Tyson uh, asking about uh, financial advisors. I definitely have some opinions here, but I'd love to hear yours, OG. Well, there's no right or wrong answer for any of those things. It's really from the perspective of where do you have gaps or where do you think that you might? And is there something else that you can do with your time or energy that offsets the time and energy savings, I guess, by having a third party person there? So there's plenty of really capable people who manage their wealth that have millions of dollars. And they would say, there's no time to hire somebody. And then there's lots of people who have $20,000 who have it just sitting in cash who are so paralyzed by the decision making that they're losing money hand over fist by not having that money invested or whatever the case may be. So it's going to be pretty unique to everybody individually. But I'd say when you reach the point in your life from a complexity standpoint where you say, okay, I'm starting to second guess my own decision making, might be a good place to start. Yeah. My thought process is it's always good to have knowledgeable people in your corner. And I like this idea that uh, Tony Stubblebine from Coach.me said when he was on the show. And he said, getting people that are super smart in your corner, that are great at things that you're either not great at or somebody that can kind of look and find your blind spots is always a great idea. But you don't need to think of them as permanent as a lot of people do when they think about these things. So as an example, uh, Tyson, if you're trying to get out of debt, I know plenty of phenomenal bloggers that have been there that have created courses where they can show you all the stumbling blocks they went through. You might pay a very, very small fee to go through that course or to get coaching time with those people and you'll get out of debt faster because you've got this right. guide that helped you there. And then when you're starting to set up your budget, there's budgeting experts. I mean, I'm looking at like the people that run YNAB, a good budgeting software tool that a lot of, I'm sure, fans of the show use. So setting that up and getting that working, there's experts in that area. And then when you have assets, there are people that actually help you then look at the full picture, you know, holistically to see how that works. So let's put it this way, rather than put, I was about to put it very negatively, let's put it positively. It's always great to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. It's always a great idea. You succeed at that on a weekly basis. I, thank you. But mom is upstairs. We can compliment her later. That'll be fine. See? Touche, man. Hmm. Touche. You like, learned that from me, from being around me so much. I, 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 I might not have, but nice try again. Uh, thanks, Tyson, for the question. Got a question for the show? Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. That gets you in the queue of questions and looking at the questions. We have a few here, but we are always excited to answer yours. Looks like OG looking at the questions. We have a, we should have another letters episode coming up soon. Cause I'll tell you. Knock all those out finally, huh? Well, I'll tell you what's really cool is that now that we no longer have letters to the show, now it's going to be a series of voicemails, and I think that's better radio, too. Ah. You know, instead of having Joe. But not a letters episode. It's a voicemail episode. Yes, it will be. Calls to the show episode. Big thanks. People have left a review of this here podcast. This comes to us from Zero Emission. Five stars, impressive interviews of various guest speakers. I'm amazed at the quality of the guest speakers and Joe's interview skills, where he asks in-depth questions about the guest books or business ventures. I also appreciate the witty banner between Len OG, Paul I like OG can read the financial news headlines and remain calm and stay focused and not easily swayed by background noise. I like hearing how your team answers financial questions, but wish the questions could be answered in a more interactive manner, since I'm sure that will change your response, customized response better. Love the cerebral effect of listening to your podcast during my long work commutes. Reminds me of, of the car talk show with muffler sounds and all. Well, it's funny you say that, zero mission. We actually, when we started this podcast, I've said this before, that I have been told that I sh should create a podcast and uh, I had nothing to say. And then I realized one day listening to car talk, I said, nobody's doing a show like Car Talk in the financial sector where you're surrounded by good financial stuff, but you were not necessarily concerned about people learning anything. I feel like you learn more. You learn more when you're just playing around having fun. It truly is 
frankly, and I'm not going to say this over and over again because we don't want to ruin our, our reputation, but I do think you learn way better. We're being sneaky. When you, when you play. We're being sneaky. Yes, yes. So thanks for that. If uh, you could leave us a review of the show, that'll tell people what they're getting into when they listen to Stacking Benjamins. Also, last thing here, speaking of financial advisors, OG and his team are taking clients now. So if you'd like to get on their calendar, the way to OG's team is this, stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG. All right, that's going to do it for today, peeps. Thanks for hanging out with us on a Wednesday. We'll see you back here on Friday. Fry yay. Doug, take it from your man. What should we have learned today? Yep, sure thing, Joe. I got it. First, everybody, take some advice from Carl Richards and get out of your head. While financial situations often seem complicated, they're much easier if you get rid of all the fluff and just get back to the basics. Second, Susie and cannabis or blockchain? Yeah, that's not a strategy. Maybe invest that way for fun, but don't consider investing that way as skilled advice. But the big lesson, do not touch the air conditioner in Joe's mom's house. If you're ever visiting, you're probably going to get your hand slapped. I only want it two degrees warmer, lady. Two degrees. I'm not asking for that much. Jeez. Thanks to Carl Richards for stopping by. You'll find everything about Carl's work at BehaviorGap.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests, in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. I don't know if you know this, OG, but they're showing uh, superhero movies at the Cineplex these days. What's a superhero movie? I know. I had no idea. It's it's amazing. Brand new thing. Superhero movie. You can see one, two, three, five, fifty. Seventy-two. Yes. So uh, Spider-Man, this movie called Spider-Man was coming. Well, I'm kind of sick of superhero movies. I thought, eh, let's go see this thing. I'm going to play this trailer, including the beginning for Spider-Man, because it also includes a very uh, important announcement for people that haven't seen Endgame. The Spider-Man Far From Home trailer is about to play, but if you haven't seen Avengers Endgame yet, stop watching because there's some serious spoilers about to come up. But if you have seen Avengers Endgame, enjoy the trailer. Everywhere I go, I see his face. I just really miss him. Yeah, I miss him too. I don't think Tony would have done what he did if he didn't know that you were going to be here after he was gone. You going to be the next Iron Man now? Well, no, I don't have time. I'm too busy doing your jobs. Oh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Look, keep up the good work because I am going on vacation. Heads up, Nick Fury's calling you. I don't really want to talk to Nick Answer Fury. Why? Because if you don't talk to him, then I have to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. 
You sent Nick Fury to voicemail? I gotta go. You do not ghost Nick Fury. What up, dorks? What's up? We're just talking about the trip. I'm here in St. Marco Polo. Oh, I think MJ really likes me. How was we when I first fell in love? You're a very difficult person to contact, Spider-Man. Uh, don't ghost Nick Fury, OG, because he'll show up at your uh, hotel room in Venice. Uh, he will put a tranquilizer dart in your roommate's uh, neck and uh, proceed to tell you that whether you want to or not, you're going to have to save the world again. I am terribly confused. I thought that Nick Fury was dead, too. Did you see Endgame? Yeah, I think. That's the one where... Yeah, but big Thanos guy, right? But in 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 Endgame, uh, he came back. Everybody came back except the few people who died. What do you mean he came back? When did he come back? Everybody came back at the end except the three. Did you miss the entire what happened during Endgame? Big explosion, lots of people shooting and stuff. I don't remember seeing him. I thought he was dead. He 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 is not dead. No, he he evaporated like people. They were able to bring them all back, except for the people who died. So yeah, the people that yeah, but he he didn't die in that. He died in another episode somewhere. No, Nick Fury did not die. Nick Fury is not dead. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, agree to disagree. Hard to <laughs> you, you're disagreeing with the movie that has him in it. Uh, I'm not convinced that it's him. Maybe it's a bad guy. I'm always amazed when I hear Tom Holland talk because when he talks as Spider Man, strong American accent. But you heard him at the beginning of that trailer. Yeah. British guy. Not American. Yeah, not. But man, does a does a fantastic job. And speaking of fantastic job, let's talk about this film. So he's on a school trip hoping to uh, tell his girlfriend, MJ, what he thinks about her. Finally, lay it all out there as a high school kid, nerdy high school kid, hoping to, um, you know, finally get a girlfriend. And uh, of course, there's the rival boyfriend figure. There's a lot of uh, high school stuff going on at the same time. He's got this thing going on over his head. Jake Gyllenhaal shows up as another superhero fighting these bad guys around the world. Nick Fury says that uh, he's, he, he should probably get in there and help. He does. Chaos ensues. What do I think? This was a ton of fun. Like, especially after the last couple that I saw, you know, Aquaman, not, not great. That's a DC movie though. Yeah, it was a DC movie, but superhero movie wise, I don't know. Lots of great, beautiful underwater scenes, but just not, yeah, very paint by numbers. Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel, once again, paint by numbers, checked all the boxes, but that's what it did. It just checked all the boxes. It was like, yes, it's just same crap, different movie. This wasn't that at all. Hmm. I actually felt invested at the end of the movie. I was very surprised. Like when stuff happened at the end, how I, I just felt like I was in it. In fact, I remember thinking, I'm like, wow, can't believe I'm actually, I'm actually here. Once again, weird as hell. There are big things about the movie that happen after the end of the movie. So they have that kind of halfway trailer clip and then if you wait to the very end, there's another. The halfway one, you don't want to miss because that's a big, big, big piece of the movie. And then the one at the end, kind of hilarious. Uh, don't need it, but I'd, I'd stick around for it. What? it. It was amazing. Once again, the whole movie theater, nine tenths of it cleared out before the first one. And I'm like, wow, that changed the entire movie. Like seeing what happened mm -hmm. during that clip at the end, partway through that little Easter egg. Good Go movie. see Spider-Man. Big, big thumbs up for Spider-Man. I can't believe I'm saying that because I am so over superhero movies, dude. So over it. Yeah, but, it was... but they make $100 million every time they do it. How many... <laughs> you got that golden goose laying those eggs. But there's a reason this one's breaking records this summer. I mean, this one's really dominating the box office. And I think that's word of mouth. People, people are saying, uh, Spider-Man, pretty darn good. Okay. See you in a couple of days.